guys have. Let's do it. You're it's recording, time. Nick? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for asking, yeah. But no, <laughs> yeah, ta- it's just ta- we're talking for business, guys. This is the fun part. <laughs> Welcome to the Why Not Podcast. Why Not is a mindset that moves you towards your vision and gives you an opportunity to reach that goal, meet that person, or learn that skill. I'm Nick Pratt, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nate McDermott. How's it going, today? What's up? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me once again. Mm-hmm. I've come to realize that living with a growth mindset allows you to thrive during challenges and helps you see failure as a springboard for growth. You start to view obstacles as opportunities for stretching your current capabilities. Adapting a growth mindset creates a passion for learning rather than a desire of for, for pro- approval. It allows you to understand that human qualities such as intelligence, creativity, and relational capacities can be cultivated through consistent practice. Our next guest, Ryan Roth, lives with a growth mindset and it has allowed him to reach high levels of success in athletics, entrepreneurship, and family. Ryan became involved in the family contracting business as a teenager. However, he decided that he did not want to take over the family business and focus on athletics. Through hard work and and dedication, he was able to become a professional baseball player and sign with the Los Angeles Angels. His dream of building his career in the major leagues didn't happen and it left Ryan wondering what was next. Through networking with high-performing leaders, he found mentorship with one of the top businessmen in the region and nationally recognized roofing contractor. Over the next four and a half years, Ryan learned the mindset, vision, strategy, structure, systems, and processes of a $50 million per year local contracting sales organization. Today, Ryan uses that knowledge to grow his company, Sales Transformation Group. He is on a mission to help contractors transform their companies with predictable sales models. Ryan Groff understands the value of a growth mindset and lives accordingly. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Nick, Danae, great to be here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Your name is literally the growth mindset, the growth mindset. So I just noticed that as reading it. <laughs> like it's meant to be. <laughs> you should write a book and call it that. <laughs> Um, so I see you're in tank top and a little beachy hat and you recently moved to Hawaii. So how's the island treating you? How are you doing out there? Oh, it's tough. Tough here in Maui. Tough life. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do most days? What do you find yourself doing? Is it still pretty like, uh, possible to go to the beaches and stuff? Yeah, thankfully. Um, yeah, it wasn't long. We actually moved here right at the early stages of the, the COVID crisis. So we okay. got out of the, the populated area and where we were living in South Florida and really glad we're here. And so there's no tourism currently. There will be some soon, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty low key and they had some rules early on, but thankfully they didn't last. And we were quarantining anyways for two weeks. So we, we, ch- we went to the beach, but we had a cop tell us, you know, got to go back home, you know, once, but then soon enough, we were able to get back on the beach and hang out. That's awesome. Stuff like Perfect. That. So your, your wife's pregnant. Did I see a, a Instagram story? Was she, is she still hitting this? She, is she cruising on the surfboard? I thought that was pretty good. Am, am I right there or no? Oh yeah. She's, <laughs> she's a warrior. She's uh she's cool. Yeah, oh, I love it. We're, um, she, she doesn't go like often because it's, it's tough on her body, but, she loves it, man. And uh, we went last uh, on Saturday. So, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much working away, you know, uh, like pretty normal. We're just doing it here in Hawaii. And so, I, so I'm cool. starting my days a little earlier. I, I was up quite early this morning and I'm, I don't mind it. It's great. And um, end yeah. of day, and then get out. Um, I'm always up pretty early. Uh, actually, this morning we're up at three. I'm usually up at four. And wow. Because the day's begun yeah. over there, you know. And yeah. so I'm up. I get my coffee, have some quiet time, got my team huddles, got my sales guys, got everybody moving, got nice. you know, calls, doing coaching. It's a lot of fun. And on the weekends and in the afternoons, we're, we're playing and we're out in nature enjoying oh, family time. That sounds great. That That's sounds so great. Cool. And I, I know that that was always something that was important to you too, was getting more time with the family. You know, you're doing a lot of traveling at one point. So it's almost like the situation where you're able to kind of take everything virtual, right? During this process, so it's probably a nice transition for you in a weird way, hey? Dude, it's been awesome. It's kind of forced me to get creative and do the things I've always wanted to do on the digital side. So mm-hmm. you know, whether it's funnels, ads, mm-hmm. remote sales team, all coaching delivered online. So actually, it's way more scalable. Because, and and um, I'm not being reliant on going to another show or traveling. And yeah, I mean, I've been doing that for like seven years. So my 
my wife and I uh, were grateful to, to do this. And so that, that's been a thing for sure. So being here, it's been a deposit into her, our marriage, mm. our children are doing better. Um, in the meantime, the business is actually getting stronger. So I feel uh, grateful for that. Um, so yeah. Just Super cool. Kind of thing though. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a success story for sure. Well, congrats on that and congrats on the baby on the way. Um, so, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about is you were born in an entrepreneurial family, right? Why did you decide to not take over that, that family contracting business? Good question. I would say that um, entrepreneurial family is a, it's a pretty strong overstatement, right? They were mom and pop. It was uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> not um, high level entrepreneurship. I think that, you know, many of us grow up and I think if you're a growth mindset, a you know, person with a growth mindset, you realize your parents did their best. You know, they loved you the best they could. They, they're, they're not evil or whatever. <laughs> and, um, mm-hmm. and so for me, I, I kind of got to this point where I'm like, well, they did their best and um, I got to learn from that. I got to take that information, the good or the bad uh, and run with it. So for me, I saw them struggle you know, in their marriage, my mom and dad and my mom and stepdad. I saw just kind of enough. Hey, I don't really want that. Um, not that I don't want to be in relationship with you, but I got to find another way. So for me, baseball was like a healthy uh, exciting kind of out, outlet for me to say, Hey, you know what? I guess I, I can go to school. I can get a scholarship and then maybe play pro ball and then hopefully be a big leaguer and the league minimum is 500 grand. So sure. That makes me rich. Yeah. That, sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So t- at that time, um, but then I, now I realize how taxed that is, how much more, how, how hard it is. And, and I'm, I'm thankfully a business. You can far su- surpass that and um, have a lot of success and be with your family. So I think, mm-hmm. I think that was at the time, uh, important for me to find a, what does success look like? And I think that's a, that's a compass that we all need to have in mind is what is success. And it's evolved over the years for me as I've grown. Um, but at that time it was like, I want to do my own thing. I want to do something different. I, I, I love you guys, but you guys are a little, little jacked up right now. <laughs> I want to go find something else. Um, and, um, and so I did, and it kind of gave me some experience and, um, a lot of ways. I mean, I was not your scholarship, uh, big time guy. I, I walked on to FAU, got right. registered, walked on to Indian River Community College, worked at Red Lobster at night, got the FAFSA loan, you know, paid for all that stuff. I was the only guy on the team that had to pay my own dorms. I paid, and then I played that year, got drafted by the Pirates, went back to the su- that summer. I knew that working hard is the way to go. So I gained like 25 pounds of muscle, all legally, while everybody uh-huh. was juicing. And I, uh, I came back and I had a really good season. I was MVP, got uh, an offer by the pirates, decided not to sign with them because I felt like school was important. I didn't feel quite ready to play pro ball because I didn't have the emotional family support. I was on my own. And so mm-hmm. you either learn to figure out how to support yourself or you, you crumble. And so I was in that place where I had to do that. And so by the time uh, I went to, to division one baseball played at Oral Roberts. I had a great, great year, great scholarship, great environment, signed again with the angels and played a couple of years. Um, so, you know, for me, it was like, I wanted to, I didn't want to have any regrets and say, Hey, I could have been a baseball guy or I could have been a pro and I didn't give it my best. And at that time, um, that was more appealing for my, uh, for, for making me feel valuable, I guess, at the time in my life to, to be an athlete because, you know, I enjoyed it. How, how yeah. good did that did that run feel for you though? So when you were the only guy that was paying your way to then you know getting drafted, how how, how good did putting that work in and then getting to that point feel for you? Great question. Um, yeah, it was good. That's a. I'm glad you asked that. I haven't thought about that in a long time because those feelings were good. You know, it was like, Hey, I put in the work. I went to the cage, the extra mile is a lonely road. You guys are smoking weed and hanging out mm-hmm. partying. And I'm like, dude, you guys are not going down the right path. I'm trying to be a pro. Like I got to do what I got to do. So I felt, I felt like a lonely guy for a long time during those, you know, when you're going hard, I mean, nobody's doing that. I mean, it's not like I'm, I played with a bunch of guys that are in the big leagues or else we'd all have been working hard and would have been a more popular cohort. It wasn't like that. It was a lot more, 
you know, Groth, let's get freaking wasted. I'm like, <laughs> I can't do that. I gotta work out. I gotta so focus. I just, uh, yeah. So it was it was good. It was a good feeling because I think you know I gotta tell you I've had two sales guy two guys that are salesmen, yeah. roofing salesmen now. Yeah follow up with or reach out to me seeing what I've been doing and they bought our program. <laughs> no way. Really? <laughs> because they, they knew me back in the day, dude. They were like, Groth, you're a little intense, but we always knew you had a good heart. But you're smart. And, you know, but you're the one doing better than us right now. Yeah. So, Did you have any athletes wow. that you looked up to then um, in terms of like their mentality, like a Kobe Bryant or anything like that? Hmm. Yeah, I was, I was more, unfortunately, uh, I was more, concerned with if I had big muscles and I hit a lot of home <laughs> runs, I'm going to get drafted because 1998, <laughs> I was 12. Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds, you're in that oh. steroid era. And so oh, all I yeah. did work out like a, in a meathead versus, <laughs> um, versus like knowing myself, knowing my emotions, being aware, knowing how not to get too excited or not to get too down. I mean, if I had that stuff now, I teach that all day now, but I didn't have mm -hmm. that when I played. So I was, um, I was more emotionally all over the place. There was a lot, lack of identity. There was a lack of um, security. There was a, a lack of trust in myself and others. There's a lot of pressure I put on me, on myself to be great and not just give myself time to fail and enjoy the process. Like there was a lot of um, anxiety during those mm -hmm. times because I was trying to find valid validity, right? I was trying to find validation. Right. I was trying to find a sense of, Hey, if I get here, then I'm special, right? If I do this, then I'm great. And so I was, I was wrestling with that quite a bit. So unfortunately my mentors were way more, um, based on status and outcomes versus like mm -hmm. studying and learning about like how they thought, right. How they approach life, how they approach the game. Because mm -hmm. I think that if you know yourself, and you have a, a good sense of identity, you have convictions, you know what's truth, you know what's false, you know what's good, you know what's evil, like those things are important to you, you know that, and you have your emotions strong, you can do anything well. Um, and so skill-wise, I think there was some talent, there was some ability, but I couldn't fully realize that at that time just because of the stage of maturity I was and things like that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had a better answer for you. I was clinging. I like to, that answer. You know. I like the, I like the more, the deeper, the deeper responses anyways. I think that a lot of motivated people struggle with that kind of anxiety too, right? Like they, they want something and you, you, you have these, these motivations and desires, but it takes a long time. And when you just, when you first start that process, you don't really know that, right. And you don't know yeah. what's going to happen. And then there's so much uncertainty. And so I think that's part of the, one of the best parts of the journey though, when you look back at it. I can go as deep as you want, bro. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I got all kinds of good stuff in there for that, for right. at least from my perspective. But yeah, I, I mean, you know, if you, if you look back at like why somebody works so hard, right, for, to do mm -hmm. anything, I think that, um, I think that the way the world works is a couple, like there's a couple of different, this is one of my lenses. So I think people if they ever had shame in their life, they're afraid of it happening again. So they try to control their environment to avoid it from happening. Mm -hmm. So shame, fear, control. So for me, it was uh, my parents divorced when I was eight. Uh, my dad was drinking and boozing and really insecure. And I was like a roommate at 14 versus a son. And I didn't feel safe. Right. I didn't have, um, we were always struggling with money. Right. Uh, I always felt like the weird kid, you know, I could, I, I was, I couldn't fit in. I hung out with the freaks one day and the jocks one day and then mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, the wiggers, we used to call them wiggers back in the day. Like, you know, I would wear boss jeans to try to be cool. I would, I would do whatever to try to be cool because I didn't have, I didn't have like a, a true sense of confidence because why I was, a, I was, I was ashamed of seeing dysfunction in my life. So what I did was I was like, anything that looks like being great, I'm going to chase that. So mm -hmm. if I could, going to baseball, I'm going to chase that. If I did good grades, I'm going to chase that. If I can look good and have good status and all that, at the end of the day, it's all just a function of ego. I'm sorry. It mm -hmm. sounds good until ego takes hold and then ego becomes puffed up. It becomes problematic. You become narcissistic. You become self-consuming. So I think as long as you know why you're doing it and you really take mm -hmm. inventory, then, um, then that's a huge, a huge part of, of, uh, of at least my journey is, is, um, but why, why do you do what you do? And you ask why again, and then why mm -hmm. again, and then why again? And then if you realize like, 
hey, I just want to help others, serve others. I'm, I'm, I'd rather be useful than known. Mm-hmm. Um, and that starts to change the game because uh, you're not – Everything changes. To, everything changes, right? Everything that, changes. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's I, crazy. So. so it was the ego thing. It was the, once you're kind of able to bring down your ego a bit, do you think that was part of your transition to kind of find what you were supposed to be doing, find happiness and actually kind of a purpose then? Yeah, that's still where I'm still working on all that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, the ego. Yeah, but the, I feel like the ego is a big problem that everybody has to deal with. But the better you handle that, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like what you said about taking inventory and um, kind of checking yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> That's good. But you were so young and the fact that you were learning all those things and kind of um, spreading your wings and doing it by yourself is cr- crazy. So give yourself some credit for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, well, what do you feel like you learned in baseball or athletics in general that you still use in your life today? Um, I would say that leadership – team fundamentals you know you look at leadership team fundamentals and work ethic i'd say so Mm -hmm. as as an athlete you have to lead or you're following a leader um you know being a coach and in the industry of contracting for example i'm leading like a few hundred companies and salespeople that are like listening to what i have to say so like conviction um and you know just i don't want to say inspire and motivate but just give them the direction and guidance. It's just leadership, right? So give them what they need, give them the tools that they need. Um, Leadership in your family, right? Like, you know, I know that uh, when you're around athletes, you see, you see character, you see coaches, you see different types of styles and you see how it affects the team. So I feel like, you know, my, I got my company and I got my clients and I got my, I got my team growth, right? We got our hands (laughs) in good team growth on three, ready? One, two, three, team growth. And we, uh, (laughs) And all the kids, we're, we're all, we know we're a family, right? So there's leadership there. Um, yeah. I'd say, so what was the second thing? So leadership, team, right? We're a team. We're working together. Uh, everybody's got unique gifts, but it's all unto something, right? If you look at the sports, you, you, have, a, you have like a, a, a goal. And I think what I love about business is that you can create your own goal all you want. You, it's not like a, in, in sports, you have like a championships already predetermined right you mm-hmm. need to win the super bowl what i love about business is you're able in life is you're able to kind of shape your own goals and it can it can evolve and it really tells the kind of person you are when you when you do that right like what kind of person has these goals what kind of person has these goals and so i love the creativity and the freedom and the liberty that comes with goals and team because then you can create interdependence to go on to a mission so right. You know, but what's your mission? What are you trying to do it for? So that I think that's pretty important that I've seen. Um, fundamentals is another one. So when you look at fundamentals, you know that there's nothing new under the sun. Like there's not some magic bullet. Like if you look at sales training or you look at business, I mean, at the end of the day, you have profits, right? And then you have operating expenses, like fixed expenses to function. And those can be optimized. You got to make sales and put those on the whatever your business model is, and you got to generate leads and awareness to create opportunities that close and that become sales. And fundamentally, there's like best practices that support all of those functions of your business. So I think that when you are a an athlete, you know the power of a fundamental. You know, being a fundamentalist, like like I can sit here and do bat, like we could talk about hitting right now, Nick. If you and I were doing a lesson, I wouldn't say, hey you should finish your swing like this. I would say, no, let's go back to when you started. Like, let's look at your grip. Let's look at your stance. Let's look at what happens when I start to, you know, bring the ball back and release the ball. So uh-huh. that's what coaching is, right? Like you work backwards and typically the causality of the outcome you're not looking for is early, either mentally or, or early stage act- activity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I like to see is cause and effect like sports. There's a cause and effect with, with football, with baseball, with everything. So I like that. Um, that sports has taught me how to be a fundamentalist, like understand the, the power of repetitive, consistent action, not like one quick thing. Like, like, look, I mean, Nick, you, there's no lucky shots, right? Like Kobe mm-hmm. worked for those shots, right? Like those are fun. Like he created shots through the fundamental of the game, not, 
oh, I just made a sale this month. I just happened to get one. No, dude, mm -hmm. I, getting lucky. What I did to create that sale, right? Like I had the right mindset. I had the right activity. I had the right volume. I had the right messaging. I had the right target. I had the right decision maker. I had the right questions I asked. I got the right information. I presented a solution at the right time with the right people uh, when they needed it with people who had money. And then they bought and then they actually have to get the results too. And then you do that over and over again. You have enough people who love you and they are grateful for your results and they, the experience they have. You have case studies that you're able to assemble. And then that makes your front end part of your engine stronger. So it just keeps, and then it just keeps going. Like, so that's what I love about that. And then lastly, work ethic. Um, I don't, I don't know how to, like, I know how to relax. I'm getting better at being still. That's a new thing for me. So I'm getting better. <laughs> That's tough. I feel you. <laughs> I'm learning how to like stay good with myself for a few minutes. Cause you know, meditate, you know, Nice. that's new. I wasn't always like that, but at the end of the day, it's, here's how I like to look at it. Like, okay, what gear do I be in right now? Am I, when I'm debriefing, mm -hmm. day, talking to my wife, does she want to hear fifth gear, Ryan? Mm -hmm. Well put. Yeah, yeah. It's like sprint. It's kind of like sprints, right? You go all out and then you bring it down a notch, right? You can't be you sprinting the whole day. Yeah. And I think that I, <laughs> I've in the past, I've been, I spent it all day and I'm exhausted <laughs> and I didn't even realize it. Like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. For like, yeah, I'm yeah. I feel like I'm I'm sweating on her. <laughs> Just like chill out. Yeah, so no, I, relax. I feel you on there. But yeah, just knowing when to go first to fifth. Um, but yeah, when you're time to go to fifth, you go to fifth gear and you get it done. And then you know how to dial it down. So that's kind of mm. the work ethic part. I wish I did that in baseball. I wish I knew how to relax and when to work, right? When to work, mm -hmm. when to relax. So um yeah, that's my four part answer to your question. Yeah. I, I love I like that. Yeah. So one thing, so, you know, when you were playing for the, the angels, you know, you show up to practice, was there any players, you know, that you saw that you're like, wow, this guy, like, he, you know, he shows up early, he works harder than everybody. He's got the best attitude on the team. Was there anybody that, that stood out to you? Yeah, I played with a few guys. Um, everybody's still different personalities, but I would say that being a, a worker, I was the worker. I was always, I was one of those guys that did the work. So what now looking back, what I'm impressed with is, is confidence and stability emotionally. That's what mm -hmm. I'm impressed with. So like people who can just every day, they're just mm -hmm. the same. And they get it. They, so there's this one I guy that. Who played in the big leagues, Alexi Amarista. He's like a mm -hmm. five foot five little mm -hmm. um, Venezuelan guy, literally five foot five. The dude was a baller. He can just, Boom, he was hit balls in the gap. He was fast. He could play second base, play shortstop, play third base, play center field. Nice. And the guy just didn't ever look phased. And I just love that about yeah, about us. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I look up to that a lot too. Like when, whenever anything happens, right, it doesn't matter. It's not phased. Just keeps going through the motions. Keeps showing up, right? That's hard and to pull it, off, yeah. Right? Like just always stable, not too high, not too low. And like I think one thing that I actually heard from a Kobe Bryant video was he's like emotions just kind of come and go, right? So you just got to ride the wave. They come and go. You know, this mm -hmm. is impermanent. They come and go. Oh, yeah. I love that. Thank well, let's say um, next question for you is let's say if someone is going through a big transition in their career, um, they're looking for the next step, like kind of like you did. Um, do you have any tips for them? Sure. Um, I would say being an entrepreneur is more fun than working for somebody. So I would say if you're looking for, uh, but what I would say is if you're going to work for somebody, um, do it for knowledge, not for money because you're never going to make a lot of money working for somebody. Like you're not going to make like 500 K working for somebody. Like you're not going to make a million bucks working for somebody, you know, like unless you're like, like in reality, you know, like just, and that's, that's the kind of money that I'm, I would say we should try to live with not because it's about status or about this. It's just, you have more options, you know, you have more options in life when you're bringing in uh, that kind of money. So I would say, if you're in a transition and a career change, I would say work for somebody because of who they are and their knowledge and your, the relationships you'll build, mm -hmm. not for the money. Because I, 
the the roofing company the the contractor I worked for who who owned the startup and I was uh, the president of the startup. Dude, I was I was working hard on getting every ounce of money I could, but I was working hard. I wasn't like, and I was producing too. It wasn't like I was just asking for money for a, a entitlement. I was like, dude, I just had my first kid. I'm 27 years old. I'm ready to go. I'm 34 at the end of this month. So, but at the end of the day, I was just ready to help him, help the mission, yeah, take ownership, yeah. and learn. And I was a sponge. I was a canvas to be painted on. I didn't pretend to know anything. I had an ego. I was selfish. And I still am working through those things. But I would say that if you're in a career change, look for a dude or, or a lady who's, a, who's sharp. And also, don't expect people to be perfect when you find them. Like, listen, it's, you'll have me... You'll have me uh, no one's perfect. Like you won't find a perfect family person, a perfect business person, a perfect, you know, just, just know that you're, you're going, if you're going to look from a career standpoint, you're learning skills, you're learning a niche, you're learning an industry, you're learning how to solve a problem. You're learning how to be useful because at the end of the day, that's what gets you paid is because you're useful, not because you're cheap, not because you're lovable. Those are all helpful things, but what really makes them want to spend time and money with you is how you can help them get from a current situation to a desired situation. Like that's what matters. So I would say, listen, serve somebody's vision, do it for some, you want to make some money, but know that the knowledge and the experience and the relationships that come from that chapter, if you do it right, because dude, if you're all about the money, the mentor is not going to want to pour into you because you're just nitpicking their, you know, about money. But mm -hmm. if you're like, you're quiet about the money, you're not super loud about the money. You care about the money but you're asking more questions, right? Than anything. I remember uh, recently I read somewhere where Emmett Smith asked Michael Jordan for business advice. They met up and he asked him advice and he gave him great advice. And he's like, why don't you do this more? And he goes, you asked, nobody asks me. Nobody <laughs> says, I want your help. So I think yeah. that when you have someone like Michael Jordan, if he wants to help somebody, well, why? Because he's growth minded. And growth-minded people see a growth-minded person and want to do what? They want to invest because they yeah, know that. Pass that down. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would say the first thing you need to do is find somebody, not for how much money you're going to make from them, but for how much knowledge and confidence and experience and the skills you can develop while working with them. Because when you're in someone's favor, you're in their favor. What I mean by that is like, Hey, I love, I love Nick. If Nick's working with me, he's asking me questions, man. I love the fact that he's hungry. He's humble. He's teachable. That's an example. So that I favor you more than I would somebody else who's, you know, Hey, that's my lead. Where'd that, you know, how come mm -hmm. I didn't like, dude, go get your own freaking lead. Mm -hmm. Like be asking me what I should, what you should do in this situation versus where's my thing. Mm -hmm. So if you go into the attitude like that, I guarantee you, you'll be like a son or a daughter to that person or like a little brother or a little sister. They're going to love you. They're going to give you everything. You're going to have time on a boat with them or time at their house with them. You're going to be, mm -hmm. they're going to be sharing all their best life secrets with you. And that's what I did with the contractor. And it wasn't manipulative. I just was hungry. I just wanted to be good. Mm -hmm. So I built an authentic relationship with him, treated me like a son. I spent four and a half years with him, got more knowledge and insights and, confidence and money and financial statements and familiarity with systems and culture and leadership and hiring and firing and market addressing the market and branding and marketing and sales and estimating. And I didn't step foot on a roof. I got more education than anybody that's probably ever been in his company that's worked with him for in the last 35 years, because I just, I knew that my destiny wasn't wrapped up in a man. Like it's, it's elsewhere, right? It's between yep. me uh, and, and God and my family. And that's my value. And so now that what I do is I happen to be working for this guy. I don't know why it's happening, but I know this is something to this. I walked, um, I walked a, a line here where I just didn't know the future. I didn't know it, how it was all going to work out. Um, he, he took care of me whenever I asked because I worked for it. He gave me goals. I've made the money for the company. I got the raise. So I walked out of there starting at like 40 K a year. Uh, with commission that was pretty much stripped pretty quickly because I was making a lot of sales. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, um, and then I, I finished at like a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars salary with no bonus, no equity. And you know, nice. when you have a couple of kids, 
115 ain't ain't like real money it's good but it's not like <laughs> bank i mean i'm like can i pay taxes i'm like okay we have we have a house we have a mortgage we have two cars we eat at whole foods so shop at whole foods and we can order out on the weekends and we can have birthday parties that are pretty nice but other than that i'm not killing it so but you know what the knowledge that i gained out of that and the experience gave me what i needed so i was able to start my company and, and uh, take off and uh obviously right. you know we we're able to have more options but you got to go through those times or else you're going to get inflated your ego is going to think you know you're going to think mm. you're the biggest thing since sliced bread you're really just a speck <laughs> on the pond uh, uh, on the map of millions of other people that are better that are better than you mm. so all right, so now we're going to be going into kind of the heart of what we've been talking about, right, with the whole growth mindset. And I think that was probably one of the, the, the biggest things that probably helped you transform from, you know, an athlete to an entrepreneur, because I feel like transitional periods can be so tough for people. You know, how did that, that mindset help you get from, you know, being successful in athletics to also now being successful in entrepreneurship? So the specific the questions like around transition, like how the transition mm -hmm. And how do your mindset, I guess, you right? You, we talked about emotions, we talked about mindset and stuff like that. How did that help you with that transitional period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that for me, I don't know, a lot of people struggle um, when their identity is one thing and then it ends, right? So for me, baseball was a big part of my identity. I didn't have a lot of other options that put all my energy into that. You know what I mean? Like I was, that was an identity crisis at that time. So for me, if I'm answering genuinely was a faith chapter where I still have faith, but that really built up my faith because it gave me a lot of um, uh, just something more of a foundation that won't shake. Right. Baseball was great, but it was shaking under my feet. So I'm like, where do I go? What do I do? So I started to lean into my, my, uh, my faith, church community, assembling mentors, um, parents, uh, all that. And then because I had that environment was really healthy. I wasn't like boozing. I did a couple of times, but, uh, I wasn't, um, I wasn't like lost. Right. I wasn't like, where's Ryan. He's out there. Like, you know, like I know some guys who played baseball and they got on the drug, they got into drugs cause they had zero value and they struggled with like themselves when their baseball career was over, which is so Afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's because we get so obsessed with like our, are, are um, with like a like a stupid sport. Uh, I wore I wore this jersey. I mean, it's just a chapter. I mean, it's life so much more like so much bigger than that. So whenever I got um, you know, in that environment, it was really healing and helpful for me. It gave me a lot of support. Then I felt family was something that was important for me to start to build, regardless if I had money or not. And I didn't have any money. In fact, I had like twenty four thousand dollars of student loan debt. Uh, my signing bonus, I spent it on a freaking truck that I ended up crashing and a bunch of uh, going out. Oh. So it was oh. like, I didn't have like, I just had the fact that I knew I've gone through a couple of valleys and I've gotten out. So I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. So, um, and, and as I started to build that, I met Lindsay. And so when she and I teamed up and got, you know, got engaged. And um, so we had each other, we had, you know, a really healthy community that supported us as a couple and then when we were starting our family, that started to create, first off, like a lot of purpose behind why I would go into entrepreneurship because I wasn't trying to do it to be famous and be cool and like, you know, all this stuff. I was like, I got a family and I want to do well with my family. Right. So you have like this why kind of under you. And then also, um, I think that whenever I got involved with the mentor, the first mentor, you know, I've had a few really good mentors, but the one in, in roofing, Certainly he was invested into me because I was invested in my family. He knew that I was motivated to, you know, do well. So I wasn't just like, ah, oh, he's a temporary part-time guy. He's like, no, this is a young man who's actually trying to do really, really well. And I, mm -hmm. I see that, right. So I think he felt that. So that transition was easy for me um, because I wasn't like, I don't know. I just had, I had some real structure behind why I was, I was, I needed to transition into something. I even looked in the nursing school and I realized I didn't want to be a male nurse pretty quickly. Although I, I didn't have any other options. I was like, what am I going to do? I was, I was selling here. I was doing this. I was coaching baseball. I was working at a school and I'm like, Lindsay, I promise you, I'm going to make a lot of money. I promise you, I will figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> just you wait. Just you wait. So I, I just had to like, 
fail and kind of look around and um yeah that just kind of led me to to the right doors you just knock on all the doors until the right one opens and out and then you just turn around if that's not the right door and you go to mm-hmm. another one so that was kind of my i think you combine that with some good favor and i think uh some divine enablement um that was that was how kind of i transitioned successfully so. yeah and then transitioning from that what led you to start um sales transformation group what was like the kickstart or how did you do it? Why? Yeah, I think that um, I think the confidence to start your own company man, it takes it takes some guts. Yeah, like, yeah. it's a big deal, especially depending on where you are. But for me, um, the the chapter ran its course there. The relationship ran its course. Uh, long story, but for me, it was the right degree of, 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 uh, of fit milestones that occurred in me personally and mm-hmm. the, the skills, the opportunity, but what was really cool is I basically launched a CRM company that we didn't know what we were yet. So I was kind of like experimenting in the market, had some freedom to make decisions and realized quickly that the software was one thing, but helping them in their business was what was making the software really work because they were missing those ingredients. Then I just kept doing it and I'm like, I like this. I'm pretty good at it. You know, I speak with authority on it. I, you know, my gifts are for communication and presenting and team building and, and getting as an athlete, like that whole, the whole environment was easy. I didn't know how to code software. I wasn't like a coder. So I wasn't going to do that really well. We had limited resources. So during that time, I, I loved the coaching, but for the betterment of the company, I knew that if we were to sell one day, if, if it was like $2 million from Ryan, doing consulting and like half a million in, in reoccurring revenue from the software, they're not going to say, Hey, let's do a 10 X on the whole company. They're going to take the re- reoccurring and they're going to do a multiple on the reoccurring. My, my consulting is one X. It wasn't very valuable. I mean, that's consulting unless it's reoccurring subscription isn't mm-hmm. a valuable like exit, exit strategy, right? If you're trying to exit and sell to somebody, and so the goal was to build something that would be attractive enough to sell and then spin off, you know, a couple million bucks. So for me, I was working for that. And so I laid down that desire to bring that value as a coach. Although I liked it, I was good at it, brought cash into the company. I was like, let's build the software out. So the software is growing and people are using it. And we're not just like a coaching company that happens to have a software. Like we're really building out a tech program, a technology platform. And so as we doubled down on that, although this was necessary to get us there, we had to choose, like we had to go one direction. And after that, like there was about a year of where's Ryan now? Like Ryan, you know, I can make some sales, I, but the value that I was bringing that I was really good at was coaching. And so I felt for the better of the company, I almost fired myself so that by the time I realized that this is what I wanted to do, I didn't have to worry about like, a conflict of interest with my clients. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I was able to start that and dive right into all those customers that I've already been coaching and they hired me. So like within two months, I was at like 20 K a month. Uh, Cool. So, So, but, but then it just took off, but I had to, but if I didn't treat this business as like doing what's the right thing to do, what's best for the company. If I was just looking out for me, I would never, have been able to tap into what I built for four and a half years, be sent off with a lot of like, Hey, Ryan's awesome. Everyone blessed it. It wasn't like I left and it was, it was dirty. It was good. Like it worked. So I think that the combination of all those things helped. (laughs) That's awesome. You're working with, I mean, you know, a hundred plus companies. Right. And so obviously you see a variety of different business owners and leaders what type of mindset and characteristics do you see in successful business owners and salespeople? I mm. love this question. I would say the best companies I work with don't think they're, 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 they're very good. I don't know what you call that. Call it like real humility. Call it um, always something to learn, like learners. You know, mm-hmm. learners always looking to improve. Like, yeah, that's those are the best. Like, and I'm growth like, mindset, <laughs> right? Growth mindset. 
And they're like, ah, but we, we, we suck at this. You should see under the hood. It's not that good. We got to get, you know, and I, I think that's that, funny. Uh, that's the thing. But dude, you talk to the guys that aren't that good. They, 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 here's what happens. They go from, oh, I need your help to getting help. And guess what? They, they get comfortable. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. get, they get like, they get comfortable and they're like, man, Ryan, no, you're great, Ryan. I bought from you. This is great. You know, the ones that are the best are the ones that are like, all right, what's next? Mm. What else? What else? What else? Yeah, it's good, but I want more. And it's not like this greedy more. It's just, there's always more. Why not go, go for it, right? There's always more out there. There's always, there's a Pandora's box of anything. Like as soon as you open up marketing, dude, that's a whole Pandora's box, much mm. less sales. And sales is a, another world. Sales structure, sales compensation, sales culture, sales process, sales technology, sales everything, CRM, proposals, proposal generation, proposal uh, presentations. I mean, it's an entirely like, it's a completely different world. But the thing is the ego thinks we're good and they don't keep learning. And so they get stuck kind of being pretty good at one thing. Mm -hmm. And it's those people who are like, nah, there's more, I want more. What can I, and so for me, that's how I think I, I get, if I stay flat, I get very, um, maybe it's just like the whole, you're either growing or you're dying kind of thing. But I think it's the, it's the, it's the energy to learn. It's the energy to try. It's the feedback loops of failure that, that makes the game so fun. Not, and those are the best ones. They enjoy the game. They're like, dude, mm -hmm. I love, I love the game. And I, and I heard somebody say recently, I was interviewing them to, they, they bought for me, but he was a CEO of a, of a one day, an incredibly national brand. They, I believe in them. They're going to do wonderful things. And, uh, he said, I was a pre-med student and I caught a case of business and I never, I never went back. And I was like, <laughs> and I'm like, I think I'm going to start saying that because it's something that it's happened with me. Like as soon as I like took a whiff of it and I started to get an understanding of like how this works, like, Oh, you do this and you can do this. And this equals this. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm hooked. I love this. I love it. What's your, what, what what's your favorite part? Learn? All right. What's your favorite part about business? When you started getting that taste, what was your favorite your favorite aspect of it? Freedom. Mm -hmm. You're not, not trapped. Like you, you can always find, you can always find something. Like you can always create your own wealth if you um, use the vehicle of business with the right mindset. And the the vehicle and the tool of business in the right hands is is amazing. Yeah. So I, I started to just, I love the freedom of it, of it. It's like, Hey, it's not, it's not the government's fault that I'm not doing well. It's not the economy's fault that I'm not doing well. It ain't my daddy's fault. It ain't my mama's fault. It ain't my wife's fault. What do I need to do to really get better? Independent. Family? Yeah. And for somebody who, you know, for anybody who wants control, um, which ultimately like you don't have full control, but what you can do is, take full responsibility and ownership of what you can do and let the cards fall and then say, all right, let's do it again. What do I, and, and so I just think that that's, that's fun for me. For sure. I love it. Well, anybody that wants to learn more about sales transformation group or wants to get a hold of you, how would they do that? What's the best way to get in touch? Yeah. On, on Facebook, they can just add me. Um, okay. I'm almost at 5,000. Thing on my child. There you go. Oh. <laughs> special guest. Yeah, right. We got a special guest coming in here. It looks like. Oh. Um, I'm gonna pass on that. <laughs> pass on this. Um, so. Facebook yeah, is Facebook. the way to go. Yeah, you can have me on Facebook. I'll do yeah, voice. Get to five thousand. <laughs> um, LinkedIn. I'm good on that. Perfect. Um. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then if you guys wanna check us out just go to sales transformation group.com we have some case studies some uh some articles some video blogs nice. um we have a youtube channel it's all we're all working on everything and it's all we're all trying to get it better it's not not perfect but we're we're definitely um here to serve so if you want to grow your sales you know you want to get some of the mindset 
that I, that I shared, I guess, into you, your people. Yeah. Um, you know, they could just kind of go to the call to action, get a price and they could schedule a call and fill out a little quiz and go from there. Perfect. So you. You, for, for the last question, as we close out, Ryan, um, you know, I had something different lined up, but you know, I've, one thing that I like you when you mentioned was kind of, you know, the vulnerable stages of your, your career growth when you're talking about, you know, pain your own way and stuff like that. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff emotionally that's not quite there yet. You still figure out a lot of stuff with that, you know, your mindset, you know, what advice do you have for someone who might be in that phase of their life and is trying to get to those big goals? Yeah. Um, Hmm. I would say, man, there's so many layers. It's so, so deep. Um, I would say that go first off, just reconcile with your, with your family. If you have any issues with your mom, your dad, I would just, I would try to reconcile because if you can't honor your mom and dad, you won't be very good with other mentor figures in your life. And that's going to be the key. Like if you can't say mom and dad, I love you. I don't agree with everything you're doing or what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I, get, I love you. I'm thankful that you brought me into this world. Um, you are my parents and I honor and respect you. I think if you do that, that kind of opens up this ability to really treat authority figures with, with, uh, with the way they should be treated, whether that's a mentor, whether that's a boss, whether that's uh, anybody. I think that that's the first thing you need to do because when you feel rejected, you feel ashamed of your parents or you feel rejected or neglected by them or abused by them, you will, you will carry that over into every relationship that you have. So I would start by trying to just reconcile with them, um, yourself, you know, look in the mirror and, and forgive yourself. Um, if you've had shame, you know, whether you were abused or you abused somebody else or you're addicted or you still are like whatever that is, I would, I would really try to forgive yourself and try to feel, try to go with no shame, like get out of the shame zone. And um, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean condone your own bad behavior. Like if you're, if you're an idiot, like doing bad things to people, you need to stop, like stop mm -hmm. that. But if you're like doing your best, you know, um, forgive yourself, try to get forgiveness from others. So your heart is clean. Like you want to have a heart, a clean heart. Um, that, that right there is everything because when you have a clean heart, your mind isn't clouded as badly. You're able to be more sound in your decision-making. So if you're in that stage, I would, I would do that. I would, I would try to get, uh, have a clean heart. Cause I'm telling you, everything you say is coming from the heart, everything. So it's whatever you're saying, whether it's selfishness or selflessness, it's coming from here, whether you realize it or not, or you believe it or not. So if you're going to start to engage mentors, you want them to say, Oh man, that's a good person. Like that's a person who's good. Like that's a person who I want to invest into. I could see a return on my energy, not just as a profit center, but as, as like a relationship. Like I could see if I pour into such, such and such person, they may not have the results right now, but I know that it's going to, it's going to help them. And so you want that type of relationship with mentors. Let me tell you, if you're all hurt and you're all, if you're all offended at the world, right. Mm -hmm. And you try to go to a mentor, they're going to smell that with a 10 foot pole. They're going to say, I ain't touching that with a 10 foot pole. That person's not going to receive from me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They're not going to receive from me. And I think that's the key. So before anything, whether, whatever you're playing sport, you're going to get in the piano, you're going to get in business, you're going to get into whatever. Mentors are key. And in order for someone to really want to pour into you, they got to know that you're, you're a good investment. And if your heart's all jaded and jagged, with hurt, you're going to, so hurt people, hurt people, right? As soon as you offend the person that's hurt, they're going to push back. They're going to fight back versus they're just going to endure. So I would say that that's, that's a, that would be one of the things that I would do. There's plenty more. I'm sure I can answer, but you know, do that. Ryan, that was yeah. awesome, man. Thanks for, thanks for sharing your story today. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for thanks having me on, man. Awesome job, man.